a tweet from Box and Social ahead of her pro debut, November the 20th next month, Carolina Dubois has paired up with none other than Shane McGuigan, one of the best young trainers in the entire United Kingdom, if I do say so myself. Anyone who follows this channel already knows I have a very high opinion of Shane McGuigan, who is not only going to be training Carolyn Dubois moving forward, but he will also be training Ellie Scottney. We talked about that here on the channel not but a few days ago. The British boxing renaissance continues. Shane McGuigan, he's a big time trainer, elite level guy that only works with elite level fighters, more or less. And you see, and he's taking on Carolyn Dubois. You see, and he's taking on Ellie Scottney. You know, I don't imagine training girls used to be all that lucrative. Not in previous eras of boxing, there just wasn't that much in it. Not much in it for the fighters and the trainers that train them, the managers that manage them, and the promoters that promoted them. There wasn't much money in it before. Whereas now things are changing, and they're changing for the better. You'll notice that both Carolina Dubois and Ellie Scottney, of course, of course, they're of both course. with big time outfits. Big time promotional outfits, big time promoters that have big time platform deals. Big finance. And big business. There's never been as much money out there for a female boxer as there is right now because there's a lot more interest. I think that one of the major game changes in the sport was when they allowed women to box in the Olympic Games. That produced a cycle of amateurs, highly skilled amateurs, having gone through that amateur system and that Olympic cycle that would eventually see themselves becoming professional boxers and exhibiting a level of skill, a level of sharpness, a level of talent otherwise unseen. A level of je ne sais quoi. This is certain repertoire. Okay, can it, Frenchie? You're seeing fighters that have more malleable skill sets Versatile. in the sport than you've seen before. And it's drawing attention, it's drawing eyes, it's drawing business. The way before, a high level trainer like uh, Shane McGuigan, he might not have had very many, if any, girls in his gym. Might not have been training very many, if any, girls. Now, you know, he's training Ellie Scott, and he's training Carolyn Dubois. You know, before that, he was training Chantel Cameron. The relationship was strained between, you know, Chantel, Cyclone Promotions, Shane McGuigan. She didn't like how she was being treated over there. She felt that, you know, a female boxer wasn't a big priority to them at that time. A few years later, Shane's training two girls, not just one. And, you know, maybe it's because things have changed and maybe the financial incentive just wasn't there before the way it is now because there are that many more major platforms, recognizable ones, investing in these women boxers that are very talented, by the way. Many of which I love. Chantel! And this is the guy's livelihood we're talking about, after all. Training fighters. And if there wasn't much money in training a female boxer, you know, what's the guy supposed to do? I mean, maybe that was the situation. Maybe that was the case. I don't know. I'm just bouncing ideas around. But now, now, the tide has shifted. The tide has turned. And there is it's more money out there. It's more money for the fighters, more money for the trainers, making this a better era with more opportunities for women boxers than the previous era had for them. And that's not saying that we should mull over the sacrifices in the work that the previous era's women boxers have put in. We wouldn't have got here without them. But it's safe to say that this era yields more opportunities for these women boxers and the trainers that train them. They're not ignored, not as easily anyways. They're not viewed as some sort of novelty circus act, circus acts anymore. These are serious professionals, serious athletes with serious pedigrees that need serious trainers like Shane McGuigan. So this is very good news for Carolyn Dubois. She's in good hands. In heavyweight news, newly crowned unified champion Oleksandr Yusik says only Fury thinks he's the king of kings. I am capable of beating him. Beating the observers him, beating him. believe Yusik will be too small to beat Fury. But the 2012 Olympic gold medal winner disagrees. I do regard this fight a huge one. I see him as a very good fighter, good athlete. He talks a lot. He has a tongue. He claims he's the king of kings, but it's only he who thinks that. That's what I say about him. Yusik said to the son. Yusik talked to the son? Not that tabloid rag. Before my Joshua fight, everyone was saying that I haven't got a single chance to win and beat Joshua. I used to hear those types of things throughout my life. But I'm capable of beating Fiori because I'm not boasting that I can just punish and beat every boxer in the world. 
I just go to the gym and do my job. I'm not trying to present myself as the king of the universe. I do what I have to do. I concentrate and I'm focused and I get the result according to my effort. But Usyk really talked to the sun? Well, that's what it says. Might be premature to start talking about what a Usyk versus Fury fight might look like because Usyk must make it past Anthony Joshua for a second time. Anthony Joshua, who's been taking a tour of the gyms here in the United States, perhaps looking to make an addition to his corner to bring something new to the table. We don't know that Usyk's going to beat him a second time. You know, people are already writing off Anthony Joshua, writing off his chances, writing him off now the same way that they wrote him off before, after the first Ruiz fight. They didn't figure that he was going to win those belts back. They thought his career was over. He was finished. But he did win the belts back, and he successfully defended them afterwards at least once en route to what became the Oleksandr Usyk fight. So maybe, just maybe, it's a little bit too soon to start talking about what a Usyk versus Fury fight might look like. But for argument's sake, let's have that conversation. I mean, let's just say that Usyk beats Anthony Joshua for a second time. Some people think he will. And if he does, and, and you know, Fury's situation gets sorted out, whatever that situation ends up being, you know, fights Dillian White, maybe beats that guy, I don't know. I don't. It's the fight we're concerned with. It's the fight itself that we are focused on. And, you know, Usyk brings certain things to the table. Fury brings certain things to the table. What immediately stands out to me is that, you know, Tyson Fury, he's got a better gas tank than... Anthony Joshua, better gas tank than Deontay Valder, better gas tank than Dillian Veidt, than Derek Chisori. I mean, Tyson Fury, as far as a big man, he's got a hell of an engine and a hell of a chin. I mean, you can knock him down, but knocking him out, that's something else entirely. Yeah, Tyson Fury's been knocked down quite a few times. Once, very early in his career, by Nevin Pajic, and again by former cruiserweight champion Steve Cunningham, two times in the first Wilder fight, then two more times in the third Wilder fight. Fury's no stranger to hitting the deck, but in that way, he's no stranger to picking himself up off that canvas and securing the W. It's safe to say that Fury's got a chin. I don't think that Alexander Usyk knocking him out is a plausible scenario. I wouldn't bank on that. Fury's engine is what you really want to focus on here. Not just his punch resistance, but his engine, his energy reserves, his stamina, his ability to keep the fight going at the same pace for the full course, for the full 12 rounds. Because of this, Tyson Fury can apply sustained pressure on Oleksandr Usyk in all the ways that Anthony Joshua did not, in all the ways that Deontay Valder did not. That Tyson Fury can be the big man and get aggressive, get front foot heavy on that front foot, lean on Oleksandr Usyk, crowd him, chase him around that ring, remind him who's boss, that he's in the land of a big man. He can do this and he can do this without tiring. That makes him more dangerous to Oleksandr Usyk. That he can apply sustained pressure on the smaller man, much smaller man, in a way that most other heavyweights cannot. And it just so happens that, well, he's a lot bigger than most other heavyweights. That presents a very unique challenge for Oleksandr Usyk. What Usyk brings to the table, what makes him a threat to Tyson Fury, is he's got better feet than Tyson Fury. In fact, he's got better feet than most other heavyweights in this division. You heard that right. Oleksandr Usyk's maneuvering capabilities, his athleticism and his coordination is well above anything that Fury's faced so far. He's a better boxer than most of the guys Fury fought. I've even seen the argument made that Usyk is a better boxer than Tyson Fury. I don't know how I feel about that. I don't, but you know, it's not the craziest thing I ever heard. And, there are, you know, Fury's bread and butter has been his boxing, his ring savvy, his ring IQ. I mean, it's not just his size. He's not just some lumbering lummox. He's not just a big man. It's how he uses that height, how he uses that reach, his stature, and how he's so nimble, so athletic, and just such a good boxer. But is he really a better boxer than Yusuk? Is that what it is? Or is it just that Fury's a better boxer than most other men his size, if not all other men his size? His size. Guess what? Usyk ain't his size. He's got a level of athleticism that... Let me stop you right here. Most, if not all of, what people are saying about Tyson Fury here today is based on the Wilder fight, 
the Wilder fight, the Wilder trilogy. You'll excuse me for saying so, but Deontay Wilder is no Oleksandr Yusik. He just don't got that kind of skill set, that kind of maneuvering capability. He's not even as prolific a puncher. He doesn't have anywhere as near the same kind of engine that Usyk's got. But most of what people are saying about Fury and what he can do, it's based on the Wilder fights. As far as boxing... Deontay Wilder and Oleksandr Yusik, they're nothing alike. Fury's a better boxer than Wilder. That much we know. That much we knew already before the trilogy came to a close. But you know, if you think Fury's the best boxer in the world based on how he looked against a guy that can't box... The reasoning is flawed. You know what you're thinking of yourself? You're thinking about the Klitschko fight. You're thinking about Vladimir Klitschko. Let's talk about Vladimir Klitschko. Yeah, Klitschko's a gold medalist, the same way that Yusik's a gold medalist, but Klitschko, he ain't as prolific a puncher as Oleksandr Yusik. Let's get that right out the way. You know, Klitschko was a safety first kind of guy. Didn't take too many chances, he didn't. And the uh, wasn't a southpaw. He wasn't in his prime either when Tyson Fury fought him. The way that Usyk is now, Usyk is peaking. He's in his best years, whereas Vladimir Klitschko, he was past his best years when he fought Tyson Fury. That's not saying it wasn't a monumental victory. It was, but there are differences to be addressed here. Essentially, what I'm getting at is you might liken Vladimir to Yusik on the premise that they're both cerebral fighters, and they both are, but they have glaring differences that makes a fight between them very different. It's very different fighting Oleksandr Yusik than fighting Vladimir Klitschko. Yeah, we can say that. The Wilder fight ranks pretty high amongst the casuals, it does. But the true testament of Tyson Fury's skills as a boxer, at least for me, it's not the Wilder fight. Wilder can't box, he's just a puncher. The real testament to Tyson Fury's skill set it's the Klitschko fight. Not the most aesthetically pleasing fight at all, it wasn't. But that's the fight where Tyson Fury exhibited a lot of skills, enough that he completely disarmed Dr. Steel Hammer. And yeah, even with that performance, he don't strike me as being a more skilled boxer than Oleksandr Yusik. As far as boxing goes. Most of you fucks don't know what to look for anyway. I'm not going to sit here and argue with you guys about it. Not when you guys are the ones basing Tyson Fury's boxing ability on how he looked against a guy that can't box. You rate him as the best boxer based on how he looked against a guy who can't box. I don't know if we're going to get Usyk versus Fury, but I will say it's a very intriguing matchup. And finally, in lightweight news, I'm sure most of you have heard by now, Devin Haney and Joseph Diaz have agreed to terms for a WBC lightweight title fight on December 3rd or December 4th in Las Vegas on DAZN. Multiple sources told Mike Coppinger on Friday, contracts have not been signed yet, but details are in the process of being finalized. And I've been pretty skeptical and pretty cynical about this potential matchup I have. Uh, after years of being a boxing fan and seeing so many fights fall apart, so many fights not happen, the approach I took with this fight was a wait-and-see approach. I'm not getting my hopes up because, you know, this was always supposed to be the fight. It was. Yet, in spite of that, you know, Jojo Diaz, he fought Javier Fortuna in what was a WBC final eliminator, and afterwards you figure, okay, he's going to go straight into a Devin Haney fight. And that's not what happened. They tried to make a Ryan Gershia fight instead. And the only reason that we're here now is because Ryan Gershia suffered some kind of an injury. This isn't official yet. I'd love if it were, but it's not. All we're hearing is a preliminary report that indicates these guys have agreed to terms, but the contracts... They ain't been signed yet, thus the ink on them hasn't dried because it hasn't even been applied. And if Devin fights JoJo this year... Who does Ryan fight next year? Feeling was that the people over there at Golden Boy Promotions were going to postpone the Garcia versus Diaz fight. But if JoJo goes into this fight with Devin and he loses, does he still fight Ryan early next year? I'll tell you what, if... Eddie Hearn can make this happen for Devin Haney, make this happen for Matchroom, make this happen on DAZN. If he can do this, it's quite the safe because a lot of people have been given Eddie Hearn flack for Devin Haney's situation, even though it's not Devin's fault or Eddie's. Lopez has been all tied up with Cambosos. Ryan Garcia, out of his own mouth, said he's not interested. Javante Davis has been hopscotching from 135 to 140, back down to 135 for his next fight against Roly Romero, even though Devin Haney is a network free agent. If the people on your network, which is Showtime, if they wanted to do a fight with Devin Haney, 
what did they do about it? Or is it that they didn't do anything about it because they didn't want to make a fight with Devin? They wanted to do a fight with Rolly Romero instead. One of the biggest problems that Devin Haney faces is that, you know, he's been making very good money on Matchroom and DAZN. And these other outfits, they don't want to have to pay him that. I mean, that's an issue. That's a palpable issue moving forward that if this kid makes something like $3 million for the likes of a Jorge Linares, what's he going to want for our guy? What's he going to want for a Davis fight or a Lopez fight or a Loma fight? How much is he expecting us to give him if that's what he made for Linares? This is a real issue. That's not saying any of those outfits made him offers. The most we've heard in terms of negotiating at least one of those fights is that, you know, the Haney's, Devin, Bill, they were supposed to have a meeting with Bob and they were a no-show. They didn't come through, though we all know Teofimo Lopez meeting or no meeting with Bob Arum. He's spoken for. He still hasn't fought. He still has to fight George Camposo. We all know that. I view the kind of money Devin's been getting up front so far as a potential stumbling block because, you know, these other outfits, they aren't going to be in any hurry to pay him that. Or in excess of it. And that's why this Jojo Diaz fight is a pretty important fight for Devin Haney, who insists on remaining in the lightweight division even though he is facing a scarcity of opponents. And if by some chance this Diaz situation falls apart and dematerializes, I think he should go upstairs. I think he should get to 140. That's if the fight falls apart. If the fight doesn't fall apart, he actually gets to have it. He gets Joseph Diaz in the ring. He's got to try to put on a real show, a signature performance. It's not enough to just get out there and win sometimes. Sometimes you have to make a statement. You have to give people something worth talking about at water cooler on Sunday and Monday morning. I say that because, I reiterate, Devin's been facing a scarcity of opponents. You have any number of boxing fans and boxing channels out there devaluing Devin Haney's version of the WBC title, even though it's his version of the title that will remain once this cycle of lightweights moves up to super lightweight. That's the real version of the WBC title, not the franchise thing. Devin's career, it needs a shot in the arm. And if he can get Jojo Diaz in the ring, that fight could be the shot in the arm his career needs. But needs a signature performance because right now he doesn't have one.